What we'd like to talk about is automation, artificial intelligence. There's a lot of fear out there about where are the jobs going. We heard a little bit of it over the last day and a half. Warehouses being emptied of um, people. I'm going to go over here because that'll be safer. <laughs> Warehouses emptied of people. Um, uh, trucks that are driving themselves and not requiring people. So what happens? And of course, it's a good old false dichotomy. Right? Is it utopia where everyone's just happy because they don't have these sorts of jobs or is it a jobless nightmare where we don't know what we're going to do with the workforces? And our argument here is that it's neither. So uh, to start this all off, we're, uh, we're going to go through some of the, I don't know, you could call it head trash that people will have uh, when they're talking around the water cooler or the buzz that you'll hear. You'll hear some, maybe some of the doom and gloom that's on LinkedIn if you read that social media or any others that are out there. Um, so to start it off, um, the first point that we're going to have there is uh, robots kill jobs. Um, I don't know how many of you have probably heard something like that, like Devin was talking about. Um, you can just keep on clicking through them there. There's four more. Automation is reducing labor requirements. So obviously, if we invest in automation, we're not going to need as many positions, maybe you know, save some money there. Um, artificial intelligence will take over the uh, Hollywood doom and gloom. And uh, the term driverless technology, which has been probably one of the biggest buzz um, words, I'm going to call it, and we'll talk about that why a little bit later here. So, But to first kick it off, um, Devin's going to kind of talk about where some of this all began long, long ago. Yeah, so we think about these terms, and I think it creates a recruitment problem. What we've been talking about how is there needs to be more people in the supply chain, and we want to attract women. And you've got to ask yourself, well, why would you enter a career if the vision of it is that everyone's going to lose their job very soon? So is that true? Is that, what, is that what's going to happen? Well, first of all, can I get you to go back, please? First of all, I want you to think about the computers you have now, the phones, the laptops, the tablets, the big computers. And I want to take us back, before we go into the future, I want to take us back to the past a little bit, to the original computers. And when most people think about what the original computers were, they think about these giant mainframes, these giant rooms full of computers. But in point of fact, go on, the first computers looked like this. A computer was a person, largely female. It was a person that computed. There were rooms of these people that did the maths for cryptography, for NASA. There's some great things that have been coming out about this. I don't know if you've seen the movie Hidden Figures. Has anybody seen that film? It's a phenomenal story of both fighting sexism and racism in NASA and helping put people on the moon. So it started out that a computer, we now refer to them as a human computer, but back then that was just a computer, was a person who computed. Well, the next thing that came along was a human-assisted computer. This is really just a hyped-up calculator in our view. You'd have to put in a number, you'd have to tell it all the different operations you wanted it to do, it would spit out a number, you would then put that number back in, tell it all the operations you wanted to do, it would then spit out that number, and you'd keep on going. So it was really just a calculator, they called it a computer, and then finally, with progress came the automatic computer. Yes, for years they had to call them the automatic computer to distinguish from the computer, which was a person. So in this last picture, what do you not see? A person. So, so sorry, did, did, did they just kill all those jobs? So thousands, in fact, tens of thousands of computers, those positions were wiped out. Put your hand up if you are aware of anybody who works as a computer. No one. It was a fulfilling job. I don't think so. It's probably pretty boring. But it was a job for tens of thousands of people. Wiped out. It was disruptive. Some of them became, though, programmers. Some of them became technicians. Some new people got hired to help with these computers. And if we think into the future, jobs have been created because of the computer that couldn't even have been imagined. The web wasn't thought of. Digital media wasn't thought of. Accounting packages weren't thought of. ERPs weren't thought of. None of this was thought of. In fact, tens of millions of jobs have come out because of the computer. So it destroyed tens of thousands and ultimately created tens of millions in North America alone. That's the story we believe is illustrative of what we're seeing with the technology changes and evolutions that are coming in the future. So now enough about the past, we shall move to the future. I'm gonna keep pretending to click because it makes me feel like, yeah, see? There we go. 
So uh, let's look at some of these buzzwords, topics, what you read in the news. Um, robots will kill my job. Well, let's look at the jobs right now. Let's look at them specifically for the Canadian transportation and warehousing industry, right? This is, I, I've seen this posted, I don't know how many times and how many presentations. So uh, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of it because we all kind of understand this. We understand that we have a group of new individuals that are coming into the industry. We understand that we have a group of individuals who this is already their career. And we have a group of individuals that are going to be preparing to leave. They're going to be uh, retiring, right? Um, they probably wanted to retire at 65, but probably have not at some point, right? Uh, for varying different reasons, whether it be they still need the income or, you know, they couldn't deal with just being at home not doing anything, right? There's been a lot of reasons for that. So when we look at this, the one big thing that jumps out is that there's obviously the delta. That's what I think most presentations have talked about. They've talked about this massive amount of jobs, and when we look over time, that delta has actually increased by 2% year over year. It's not reducing, it's going up. Um, the amount, though, of people going into the industry is not going up. So what I love about hearing all these different presentations is that they touch on a lot of the same things. To be honest, it's kind of like we all got together in a room just before this whole event, and we all talked about how to align all of our presentations, so it's kind of cool how that turned out. But one of the big things is that we look at, we have to attract new people into this industry specifically, as well as others, and well, how do we do that? What do we look at? What is, what's needed for them to join? And whether that's feeling part of it, depending on what generation they're part of. We've also talked about the generations, right? Um, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit. So I want to put in there that we're really obviously not super worried about robots killing jobs here. We're actually more worried about how do we cover that gap so that we're not left um, with the crisis of not having enough people in this industry. <clears throat> so we look at automation reduces labor. So I've heard this from a few different companies, not specific to this industry, but they look at, you know, if I make an investment, I'm gonna get money back somehow, or I'm, 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 I'm gonna make more money. And some of them look at it that they're not gonna need as much labor, which is kind of a, you know, a fantasy world, I, I'm gonna say. Um, and it's because for a few things. So the first stat, because we got numbers, I like numbers, so I hope I'm not boring you too much, but when we look at studies, we look at the businesses that are actually within transportation and warehousing, only 40% of them have actually invested in their technology or automation within their company in the last two years, okay? That means 60% have just gone status quo when it comes to technology and automation. We look at, of that 40% though, 88% have had to provide additional skill training to the existing or the new staff that are coming in, right? So it's obviously a requirement uh, of the position to train them. And what you get out of this is that you get that now we're creating individuals that are higher skilled. These aren't the same positions as they were 10 years ago. And some of this is most likely what these new generations really have to hear or feel or know about the business, especially when it comes to innovation, because that's probably the one buzzword that are the, the keyword, I should say, that I hear the most around here about attracting this new generation that's coming up, uh, both the millennials and the next generations that are highly connected to um, the new technology out there. So the next stat is that of that group, then 38% still had to increase their labor even with the new automation and technology and all, all of it. Only 11% could actually reduce their staffing by a small percentage and 51% contained or uh, uh, maintained status quo. So this isn't so removing wait, any jobs. It's the afternoon and I'm getting tired of stats okay. and all the rest. So, so, so what, are you, what are you saying? You're saying that 40% of companies have increased their investment in technology in the industries we're talking about. Of those 88% actually had to invest in labor in skills training because of the technology likely. And actually, only 11% wound up decreasing labor? Yeah, so don't count on it as, you know, reducing your bottom line because you're not going to have to hire as many people, right? This means if you're going to point yourself in any direction, an investment is most likely needed. Okay, interesting. 
So let's go to the next, and let's look at some general labor trends. And we, we've talked a lot already about millennials and what they like to do, and Gen X, and how lazy we are, and then baby boomers who are retiring, and all that sort of stuff. So these are broad trends. But if we, if we, we simplify it, if we simplify it into the two kinds of categories of work, one is the muscle. What do you call this, Wade? The good old job. The good old job, right? That required brawn and muscle. This is your parents' job, is, right? Yeah. They could, they could, they, they, this is what you learned, that they went to work. When they hit 65, they could retire. They went on their pension, and they're on a beach somewhere now sipping pina coladas, right? This is the job I never wanted to have after I st you know, stacked lumber in grade 9. So those, if we go back, sorry, if those um, jobs have been reduced from t t 1990 to 2015, but look at the caring. This is the people serving people. There's been an explosion in jobs. Interestingly enough, these are jobs that millennials express that they're most interested in joining jobs that are about people. So really what you're getting is that they, they, they actually want innovation to use technology to not have to do the muscle jobs their parents had to do so that they can be chatty on social media and stuff like that, right? Yeah, I, I think you think back to this. And this is generational for sure because I have a half brother and half sister who are 15 years younger than me. So there's been interesting conversations. When I was in high school, I was so proud to get a job stacking lumber. And then later on, when I fought my way into the 7-Eleven, it was like people would come, Dev and yo, you know, and they'd try and steal candy, and i tell them no. It was, I was something. My little <laughs> brother and sister expressed to me, they were looking for a job. I was like, there's a job at KFC. There's a job at McDonald's. There's a job. Over I would never do those jobs, they said. They were millennials. Why? Oh, it's not prestigious. In fact, they would take less pay to work somewhere cool, like Lululemon's or David's Tea. They would take substantially less money for the prestige of working at one of those jobs than they would working for something that wasn't socially cool. Which to a, babe, uh, a Gen Xer who didn't, couldn't find a job when we graduated is madness, utter madness, but that is the reality. Okay, so let's switch gears. Artificial intelligence. This is going to consume us. It's going to take over our lives, and we're going to be its slaves, right? Well, that's what Hollywood wants you to think. Keeps on making the money. Reality, um, artificial intelligence is something that, in what the true sense of artificial intelligence has originally or originally meant to be, um, is something that's a little bit more sentient. So we're not actually there, right? Um, have any of you heard of the Turing test? Cool. I'm not gonna get into it specifically. It's a few tests that are out there. There's about a dozen of them. And a computer would have to pass each one of these tests to become artificial intelligence, actual artificial sentient thinking, feeling systems, right? Um, the farthest it's gotten is to trick us to think that it's a real person behind a keyboard, right? Or to maybe mimic something it's seen and we can't tell the difference in the picture that it's drawn or whatever the case is, right? So that's as close as it's gotten. Right now we have something called bots. Who's heard about bots? Awesome. I bet you everybody here in this room has a bot on them right now. It's not scary. This isn't something that's malicious. Who has iPhones? Androids, right? So all of those have programs on them that you can ask information, even speak it to it, Siri, right? These are what are called bots. Bots are programs that can talk to each other and do some amazing things, and you're gonna hear a lot more about them in the next coming years. This is the beginning of this thing that we call artificial intelligence, pretty cool. We think that it's actually, or this is a study that's done that Try to get people's feedback on what they thought and what companies are working towards using artificial intelligence for or what it's being designed for. Top three is cybersecurity and privacy. We heard about a topic about that today. Cancer and diseases. You know, we've cracked the human genome. There's massive amounts of information in health and sciences that we have. We can't figure out what this means on our own. We need a system to crunch it. Clean energy, right? most likely free energy or cheaper energy. 
It's another huge requirement. I'm not going to go through all of those, but the top three are massive advancements that we need as a society right now for a multitude of different uh, reasons that we could get into. So it's important to realize when we're talking about artificial intelligence on this level, we're not talking about um, the, was it Dave or whatever that took over the spaceship in 2001, A Space Odyssey, and killed yeah. everybody? What we're talking about is pattern recognition. Artificial intelligence, pattern recognition, so it can detect when something seems odd, that might be a cyber attack, really quickly, and then it alerts a human being. Or that looks odd amongst a mountain of data, that could be cancer, it doesn't fit a pattern. Or that looks odd, what's going on with those financial transactions, let's alert a security regulator. So instead of human beings trolling through billions of bits of information, a, an artificial intelligence is, it doesn't have the ability to do anything necessarily unless you tell it, make an action, stop something until a human intervenes. But it's to help human beings make better decisions, have more information, and be alerted in the mass of information that we're talking about to draw the human's attention to a subset of the information that they need to look at. So technology investments and integration. You can click on the first part there. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the first of our two case studies that we have. Um, we've got a little quick video that we're going to show. Of, um, some integration or future integration that companies are working on around the world to show you how things are being integrated together, how we're talking about using automation to make the existing job um, that status symbol a little bit greater to make it so that people are going to want these jobs because no longer are they the jobs that people don't want, like parts pickers or truck drivers or things like that. It's more of the they become operators or skilled individuals that have specific jobs now that they actually get trained on. So if we take an ERP system, which most companies have, it's part of inventory or sales or whatever the case is, <clears throat> we take barcoding, RFID and GPS systems if it's vehicle tracking, we have kiosks that we put information into so that we can ship and receive. Smart handheld devices for helping with inventory management or asset control. And of course, electronic notification to let us know when all this is happening, right? So we take these systems and if we combine or link all of them using what we call augmented reality, has everybody heard of augmented reality, mixed reality, and virtual reality? It's a little bit of a buzz lately. They're three completely different things. Won't get specifically into them. Augmented reality will show you actually a video of it so that I don't have to quite explain it. It's just a layer of something that's not there over your reality, which is your main focus, giving you information. And this bots thing that I'm talking about, right? So if you flip into the next part here, we're going to show you a quick little three-minute video. Welcome, the time is 6.47 a.m. There are pick requests available. Begin. Incoming pick request for customer 351. 22 items, please confirm. Confirmed. Showing me the pick list. Go to aisle 17, show 3. Show item 1. The size for item 1 is 30 by 25 by 5 and the weight of 0.5 kg. It's non-fragile. Pick 2. Two okay. One okay. Pick request confirmed. Okay. 
order complete. Warning, fault lift malfunction detected. Proceed to maintenance area. Okay. Just put both tubes together and you should be fine. Warning! Forklift nearby. Order complete. So now I remember one of my very first jobs that I had. I was in grade 11, and I worked for a company called Westward Parts. And um, I would have to say that I tried to get out of picking parts as fast as I could into some other position, because it was probably the one thing that I really didn't want to do, but it was a paycheck, and it was a good paycheck. I enjoyed it at the age that I was at, having money. Um, if I were to have something like that, I would obviously think that was much cooler. Right? I would argue that's even cooler than David's tea. <laughs> and you get to wear the spiffy glasses. One thing that was really interesting about that was, of course, you still had people, but they didn't have to invest in massive technology and redo the entire warehouse. They just augmented it with sensors and whatnot and still kept their people and made their job, I would just say, totally cool. And if you didn't pick it up, right at the end of it, <clears throat> one of the feedbacks you get from this generation of millennials, is they love instant gratification, right? That's why they play video games all the time, right? That's why I play video games all the time. I like to get all the achievements. I'm not So, so which generation is that then, Wade? I know, it's, I'm right in the middle, okay? But anyways, it's that achievement or that sense of achievement that, that tells them right away, kind of almost puts them on a scoreboard, right? Without you having to mark up something and figure out some kind of way of figuring out how to rate everybody. It's something like a video game almost at that point. So I thought that little end piece was really, really cool. Yeah, so, so it's a pretty exciting future, I thought. And then we want to talk about this term driverless technology, which, which sounds really awesome. Unless you're employed to be a driver, then it sounds really terrifying, right? Really terrifying. And maybe you're trying to attract new drivers, and this is what they're hearing, and why should they do it? Well, first of all, Let's just smash it. There's no driverless technology out there at the moment. Not anything that's truly driverless. We're working towards it. So let's, let's drop that term a little bit and look at the different stages toward driverless technology. So zero is good old hands-on driving, driver only. The, only the drivers at fault. I was at fault both times those airbags went off on my face. I cannot blame <laughs> a robot. The second part is assisted. The driver's in control, but there's some assistance being happened. So you can almost think of augmented. We already have, in some ways, some slightly augmented reality with our cars. People have those lane assist things. So, oh boy, I didn't check my shoulder. That's good. You're still driving, right? You're still driving. You get to the second part where it's partial automation. There's temporary hands off. You can take your hand off the car at certain specific times in certain specific situations and allow the car to handle itself. Let's imagine a freeway where the lanes are very well defined, it's sunny out, everything's good. This is where Tesla's at, right? You can take your hands off, but it's not driverless because you need to put your hands back on right away and you need to pay attention. They're not telling you not to look in front of the road because if something cuts in front of you. They're not telling you to leave moral judgments like, do you hit the child or do you go for the ditch? They're not telling you the car can do that. You're still the driver. Then you get to the other one, stage three, which is conditional automation. There's still a driver sitting in the car. The system will automate, and you can pay semi-attention to it. It'll give you feedbacks and information. 
That's the next level. Then you get to the high automation. The high automation means you can take your hands off the wheels, you can read a book, you can watch a movie, the car will, or truck will look after itself and alert you when you need to pay attention. Perhaps you're coming to an auto ramp, perhaps there's a change in weather, perhaps there's a condition. There's still a driver. At this level, that you can actually get out of the seat. The driver the doesn't need to be in the seat anymore. That's where this level starts. Yeah, and this is really what we're talking about. It's still a driver, though. It's not a driverless car. It's just a driver who can do something else other than watch the road the whole time. This is the stage that we've just tested as of October 2016, like we heard about earlier. That's this stage that we've just gotten to. It's a really interesting thing, and we're going to show a video about how it still works. But just, just to pause there and think about whether this means that drivers are now unemployed. This technology has been in use for decades, for decades in every airplane you've gotten on, right? There are not one, but two pilots of an airplane. They're in, control, in, in physical control of that airplane for usually less than two or three percent of the flight. They take it off and they land it. We still have two of them. The rest of the time, it's on this thing we call autopilot, right? Which is pointing it in the right direction, keeping lateral and longitudinal distance, but it has a very important function. It will alert the pilot whenever things get out of bounds, when they're in too much turbulence, when there's an issue. And that's where we really want that professional pilot to grab it and to save our bacon and to take control. So, so what does this mean for the truck driver then? Is he a truck driver still? Or is he? Possibly maybe a pilot. A pilot. Is he a pilot that now is leading a train in charge of the first one, monitoring several different a train of trucks that go behind it, each maybe three feet behind. And what a cool job that is. And they peel off and then somebody else has to take them into the city, into residential areas, but in controlled standard areas they can go. And we do live in Canada and there is snow. So there's yeah. gonna be times when the system's gonna have to go, you take charge. So to give you an example of where this is right now and what this job is evolving to rapidly, we have another video on the next slide. I think we, oh. Oh yeah, sorry, oh, this sorry. is... I'm gonna set up the story. <clears throat> First part here, we're gonna go around just like we did before. So LIDAR, which is radar, our uh, laser radar, radar, GPS systems, detailed mapping systems, cameras, of course, and a whole lot of processing power. You put this together plus about 30,000 US and you get a stage four autonomous vehicle and as pilot. That's where we've gotten to so far today. This was the test. And now, of course, because, you know, what would a presentation be without a beer commercial? I got into truck driving in 2007. I like to travel the country. That's one of the reasons drivers get into the industry. They want to see the country. It's a big, beautiful place. Anheuser-Busch is the largest brewer in the United States. We ship over 1.2 million truckloads each year. We are always looking for new innovations in technology. Auto's trucks are the next area of transportation innovation. The driver would still be involved with the pickup, loading the freight, making sure it's secure in the back of the vehicle. And then once you're on the interstate, one switch and it's driving itself down the road. Well, auto technology is all about making roads safer. It's like a train on, on software rails. And so when you will see a vehicle driving with nobody in it, you'll know that it's very unlikely to get an inclusion. I proclaimed to one of the technicians, I said, I don't think I could have done that better myself. Uh, that was an interesting moment. 
We knew we wanted an iconic American brand that was passionate about their products. Budweiser was a perfect partner. For me, I think the most important things that computers are going to do in the next 10 years is drive trucks and cars. So it's great to be uh, at the forefront of that. So I don't know about you, but it uh, made me kind of thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that the whole time that was playing. Um, but no, isn't it like, that, that's, the, that's the cool factor about how these jobs are changing. When one job goes out, just like the beginning of our presentation, another job presents itself. There are still people employed with these jobs, but they become higher skilled, they become a little bit cooler, and that's why people in the future, as long as investments are made in this, these areas, you can see why people will move into them, right? But there's a key here, so. And I, I think about when he went to the back of the truck, he started reading a book. And, and I think about the human potential we can unlock in people. The, the thing I hate the most is when I have to drive to Edmonton. I literally just want to tie the car off and go. If, if I could be there, still driver, still ready to take over the wheel, but working on an ERP system, cu contacting customers, looking at order entries, doing anything else actually other than looking at the dotted lines, my goodness, I'd love to. It could elevate and unlock us. Just like people didn't have to sit in a room and do math all day, they could do other things. And, and the truth is we don't know all the jobs and all the industries and all the things that are gonna come out of this automation. All we are is saying it's gonna be disruptive, it's gonna be difficult, and it's really exciting. So we're gonna to go to a final slide here. And we, uh, we made a couple conclusions, a few conclusions here. Uh, Take them or leave them. That's right. <clears throat> First one up. So skilled operators and automated efficiencies will improve the bottom line, not necessarily decrease your labor. Next one. Younger workers want the prestige of social cool positions in an innovative environment. They want to be able to tell their friends where they're working and be proud of it. Automation and AI should be embraced as it ultimately attracts talent and provides the competitive advantage in your industry. And the supply chain, when we look at it, it is a center of really cool things that are happening. It's exciting. And I know you all know this. You're automating in your own things. And I just don't think the story's out there. The story's not out there. That this, yeah, you can go into technology and IT and these other things. But you know, the supply chain is actually a really cool thing. And you're going to start out here. And you're going to help us over the next 20 years to transform this. And here's some videos of what it's going to look like. And here's where we're going to go. That's an exciting thing to join up with. And I think that's an easy thing for young professionals, young interested people, young muscle workers to want to get on of every skill level, of every gender, and be an exciting part of. And that's our presentation. That's it.